Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Blindsided by Fern Michaels, performed by Laurel Merlington. Chapter 1. It was a beautiful autumn day, too nice really to be indoors, but Myra Rutledge had already been out with the dogs. She'd even made a trip to town to run some errands and stopped to have a solitary, boring lunch. At the moment, she couldn't remember what it was she'd eaten. She looked around her beautiful country kitchen and wished, not for the first time, that she had some kind of culinary expertise. She'd wished so many things lately, and none of her wishes had come true. Nor were they likely to come true. Sad. Oh, how she missed what she called the old days, when she and the girls were writing justice, vigilante style. The girls, meaning Nikki, Alexis, Catherine, Isabel, and Yoko. But as Charles said, all good things must come to an end. She'd argued the point, as had Annie, but Charles had held firm with his words. After he'd bandied about the word old at least a hundred times, possibly more until she and Annie had run him off with the broom. He'd retired to his lair in the catacombs, also known as the war room, beneath the house, which hadn't changed a thing at that time. Now, though, it was a different story. Myra fingered the pearls around her neck, her great-grandmother's heirloom pearls, which she was never without. Her intention had always been to leave the pearls to her daughter Barbara, but that was impossible now. With Barbara's death years ago, her life had changed, and so would the legacy of her pearls. Maybe she'd just donate them to some charity and let it sell them off for whatever they could get. A heavy gust of wind sent a cascade of brilliant colored leaves sailing across the backyard. Myra debated a moment as to whether she should go outside and collect a bouquet for the kitchen table. She shrugged and decided that the chrysanthemums in the bright purple bowl on the table still had some life in them. Myra shivered as she looked across the room at the thermostat. She walked over and turned it up. She flopped down at the kitchen table. The dogs came running, not understanding what was going on with their mistress. She fondled all of them and babbled away about everything and nothing. She missed the girls and the boys. Presents Eyes Like Stars by Lisa Manchev. Cast list Beatrice Shakespeare Smith, a 17 year old girl. Peas Blossom, Cobweb, Moth, Mustard Seed, The Fairies from A Midsummer Night's Dream. The Stage Manager, The Theater Manager. Nate. A pirate from The Little Mermaid. Ariel, an airy spirit from The Tempest. Ophelia, daughter of Polonius in Hamlet. Sedna, the sea goddess. Also the sea witch from The Little Mermaid. Mrs. Edith, the wardrobe mistress. Mr. Hastings, the properties manager. Mr. Tibbs, the scenic manager. Chapter 1. Presenting Beatrice. The fairies flew suspended on wires despite their tendency to get tangled together. Beatrice Shakespeare Smith, busy assessing her reflection in the looking glass and thinking perhaps she shouldn't have dyed her hair blue on this particular morning, turned to glare at them when they rocketed past the end of her nose for the third time in as many minutes. If you make me spill this stuff on the stage, she said, I'll squeeze you until your heads pop off. Unperturbed by the threat, 
Mustard seed swung by her like a demented pendulum. Going in there with fairy guts on your hands isn't going to make a good impression. Nervous about your call to the theater manager's office? Moth asked, chasing peas blossom in circles. Not the best of timing, Cobweb sing-songed, hanging upside down at the end of his line. Mucking up your head right before a ten o'clock summons? I'm not getting called on the carpet with my roots showing. Bertie coated another section with cobalt flame liquid concentrate, pilfered just an hour ago from the wardrobe department. Do we like the blue? Better than Crimson Pagoda, Peas Blossom said. Your entire head looked like it was on fire that time. Maybe I should have taken Black Cherry. Bertie stuck her tongue out at the Beatrice in the mirror. Maybe Cobalt Flame will encourage the theater manager to get creative with his punishment. He'll probably just remove the desserts from the green room again, Peace Blossom said. The others groaned at the prospect. Then Moth perked up to suggest, He could make you scrub out the toilets in the ladies' dressing room instead. Or scrape the gum off the bottoms of the auditorium seats, said Cobweb. Ew. Bertie wrapped another strand of hair in aluminum foil and crimped it against her head. An excessive punishment for whistling a scene change, don't you think? Whistling a scene change? That's a euphemism and a half. You set off the cannon, blew holes through three set pieces, and set the fire curtain on fire. Quite the valuable lesson in emergency preparedness, I think. Moth twitched his ears at her. Pondering our recent criminal history, I must admit there have been more pyrotechnic explosions than usual. Maybe the theater manager thinks you're doing it to impress Nate, Cobweb said. Bertie felt the blood rush to her face until her cheeks were stained shocking pink. Shut up. It is like you're acting a part for the dashing pirate lad's benefit, Mustard Seed said. Bertie snagged his wire, reeling him in until he reached eye level. What's that supposed to mean? The fairy twitched. You know, the hair dye, the black clothes, the clove cigarettes, Moth added from below. The drinking and cursing? Is it method acting? This is a theater. Bertie, annoyed by the Inquisition, dropped him onto the stage. Several feet of slack cable landed atop the ferry in a slithering heap. Oh, you buried him alive! I told you it was silly to use the wires when you can fly perfectly well without them. But they're fun to swing on! Moth protested as the fairies shed their harnesses and went to investigate the tomb of their fallen comrade. Indefatigable, Mustard Seed emerged from the pile, rubbing his bum. If it's not for Nate, is it because of your abandonment issues? There was a very long silence before Bertie told her reflection. The only reason I'm friends with any of you is because I outgrew the Von Trapps. One annoying Austrian at a time. You could have joined the Lost Boys. They did nothing but whiz on trees, and... I'm not properly equipped for that. So you're stuck with us because of your innate inability to pee standing up? Peas Blossom put her hands on her hips as she hovered nearby. That's right. Bertie used her brush to stir the dye. We can do lots of stuff besides pee standing up, Moth said. Like sword fighting! Cobwebs slashed and parried with great enthusiasm. Call the pirates and the shipwreck scene. Mustard Seed flailed his tiny yellow boots in an improvised hornpipe. I'm not supposed to make scene changes, and thus I'm appalled by the very suggestion. You're a bad influence, Mustard Seed. The rules have never stopped you before. Peas Blossom looked knowing. You just don't want Nate seeing you with your head all slimy. Bertie put on her best Lady of the Manor air. He needn't wait for an engraved invitation to pay a social call. But he prefers you pin a note to the call board, Peace Blossom reminded her. The majority of the players drifted in and out of existence according to the summonses pinned to the call board. But the more flamboyant, dashing, or mad the character, the more freedom they had to move about the theatre. The fairies dogged Bertie's every step, whereas Nate was one for protocol. Probably all that rot about following the captain's orders. Bertie's entire head tingled as the ammonia burned her scalp. She tried not to scratch at it, because that way lay madness. 
madness, and funky colored fingertips. It has nothing to do with Nate. I need to finish my hair before the stage manager gets back. You should be thankful it's only dye on your head and not paint all over the stage. Bertie glanced at the walls of her room. The three connected scenic flats were part of the Teatro Illuminata's enormous collection of backdrops stored in the flies overhead and in the backstage scenic dock when not used. I haven't painted my set in years. Lights up on Bertie, age seven. She is painting over a dingy cream wall with something labeled Violet Essence as the stage manager glowers at her. Bertie. It's my bedroom and I'll do what I want with it. To prove her point, she splashes magenta and silver over the violet and smears it around with her hands. Stage manager, grabbing for Bertie's ear and missing. You can answer to the theater manager for this mess. The theater manager arrives with Mr. Tibbs, the scenic manager. Turning to the theater manager. Why you ever decided she needed to sleep here on the stage is beyond my powers of wrecking. Theater manager. She needed a bedroom, and this is the best we could do. Stage manager. His face turns three shades of crimson, and steam hisses out of his ears like a tea kettle. But this isn't a bedroom! We can't stop the performances for bedtime, which means she's on until the stage is clean. And look at this mess! Mr. Tips, chomping his cigar. We do not change because of flex. We touch them. Okay, fully reproduce them down to the last piece of a bit of guilt, but we do not change them. Bertie. Just because you don't change them doesn't mean I can't. Theater manager. Bertie, this place isn't about change. It's about eons of tradition. Bertie, crossing her arms. It's my bedroom. I should be allowed to do what I like with my bedroom. Theater manager, studying Bertie until she squirms a bit. That's true enough. But I wonder what will come next. One day it's your bedroom, and the next... Stage manager. Utter chaos and pandemonium! Bertie. What color is pandemonium? It sounds yellow. Theater manager. Beatrice, this is a matter of utmost importance, so I want you to listen to me and answer very carefully. Bertie. Yes, sir. Theater manager. You like living here, don't you? Bertie. Yes. Theater manager. Do you want to remain at the Teatro? Bertie. Of course I do. I mean, it's my home. Theater manager. Then you need to understand that while we will tolerate a certain amount of... He pauses to search for the appropriate word. Stage manager. Wanton destruction? Theater manager. No, I think perhaps the word I was searching for was creativity. While we will tolerate, even encourage, your creativity, you must limit it to your personal space. Bertie, frowning hard and trying to understand. So, I can paint my room? Theater manager. Yes, you may. But you're forbidden to change anything else. In that regard, you will have to learn to exercise something called self-restraint. Do you understand? Bertie. I think so. I mean, yes. Yes, sir. Now, can I have paint the color of pandemonium, Mr. Tibbs? Mr. Tibbs, scattering cigar ash about the stage. No, you may not. Theater manager. Another long moment of contemplation passes before he nods. Gentlemen, let the young lady get on with her painting. Bertie, clean up after yourself. He begins to make his exit, pausing at the edge of the stage. Please do remember what I said about exercising self-restraint. Bertie contemplated her reflection. Perhaps I could have shown more self-restraint. The girl in the mirror didn't blink, so Bertie averted her gaze and looked instead around her room. Viewed from any of the seats in the house, it would create the proper illusion of a teenager's abode. Mr. Hastings, the properties manager, permitted her to sign out bits and pieces to make it feel cozier, 
but most of her knick-knacks and trinkets were glued or nailed down so they wouldn't scatter about the stage when the scenery was changed. The audience would never know it, but there wasn't anything in the dresser. All Bertie's clothing was kept backstage in wardrobe, laundered and pressed by Mrs. Edith. The bed, an elaborate four-poster, resided on a circular lift that disappeared below stage. And then there was the book. The Complete Works of the Stage. Sitting atop a pedestal in the far corner of stage left, and just in front of the proscenium arch, it was the only thing that remained constantly on stage. Resting there, it emitted a soft golden radiance, usually lost under the thousands of watts of power that poured from the floodlights. No one dared touch it. Even Bertie, who dared a lot of things that the others never dreamed, did not touch the book. You have dye on the end of your nose, Pease Blossom said. Bertie set down her brush and wiped her face with a handkerchief that came away smeared with cobalt flame. She peeked at herself in the mirror, confirming that quite a lot of her skin was now blue. Cobweb and Moth, who'd paused in the middle of attempting to draw and quarter each other to look at Bertie, fell to the dusty stage floor, laughing themselves silly. Mustard Seed landed on her shoulder and smeared his hands around in the dye. Stop that! Bertie swept him off with a practiced flick of her finger. He somersaulted backward, then rushed to swing his tiny fist at her nose. Cobweb and Moth tackled him, leaving miniature explosions of glitter twinkling in the air. Flying fists and booted feet kicked over the bowl of hair dye, and cobalt flame flowed across the stage floor to surround Bertie's Mary James. She made a mad grab for the fairies. Come back here! You're yeah. making a huge mess! I'll cut off his ears, said Moth. I'll slice off his nose, added Cobweb. And we'll cast the bits into the, the sea. sea! Forsooth, said Mustard Seed. You'll never take me alive! Bertie tried to get in between them, but it was tricky not to step on someone. Stop it! Mustard Seed grabbed the wet, sloppy brush and hurled it at his attackers, missing them only to hit the side of Bertie's head. Several wads of aluminum foil fell off, and dye sticky strands of hair snaked over her shoulders. Bertie used a pithy curse common amongst the pirates, but Peas Blossom was the only one who noticed the air turning blue to match the spreading mess. Good thing you're wearing so much black. The boys rolled past them. Tufts of fairy hair ripped out by the roots drifted into the orchestra pit. Tiny scraps of clothing exited the brawling tumbleweed at sporadic intervals. A sleeve, a sock, a pointy-toed shoe. I'll beat you for a living! You in what army? All at once the fairies froze, like butterflies pinned to a piece of felt-covered cork. They were only ever utterly still for one reason. Someone had placed a notice on the call board. What's it say? The fairies shook free of the trance. All players to the stage, ten o'clock. Bertie swore under her breath again. Everyone to the stage, you say? She waved her arm at the floor, which was covered we'll be in back steel. shortly. Simon & Schuster Audio presents Hungry Heart, Adventures in Life, Love, and Writing by Jennifer Weiner, read by the author. For My Family I wrote my way out. Hurricane Hamilton. Hungry Heart. The other day I was walking from the hair salon to pick up my eight year old after school. It was a beautiful February afternoon, sunny and spring like, with a sweet breeze rummaging in the tree branches that were just starting to bud. Also, my hair looked spectacular. 
I was feeling really good. I put in a solid morning writing, then I'd done a spinning class where, according to the computerized ranking, they obsessively checked that I hadn't finished class. I was wearing my favorite jeans. Which are dark rims, straight legs, dragged for 70% off it. My up boots on my feet, and my, my purse. 23 for the look changed. I felt myself leave the ground, saw my arms flailing, then heard myself shout in pain after I smacked down on the pavement, landing on my knees and the heels of my hands. This is not butter that seems easy to this fall on a ball. A wind knocked out of you flat out. Oh, oh my god, people running over to see if you're okay. Face linked. I think I lay there whimpering for a minute before I hauled myself to my feet, assured my fellow pedestrians that I was fine, staggered through the school gate and inspected the damage. There was dirt and grit and gravel ground into my palms. My jeans were torn. Both of my knees were bruised and bleeding. Mommy, are you okay? Asked Phoebe moments later when she came out of the classroom and found me holding a paper napkin to my knee. Yeah, I'll be fine, I muttered. I limped outside where we waited for an Uber. No way was I walking home in this condition. And I realized that this was not just not just a stumble. It was a metaphor for my life again. Last summer, the New York Times wrote a profile of the author, Judy Bloom, in which she described herself and her. Yeah. You know what I mean? An inventor of people, Bloom said. I have a question for you when you come out. It's not that it's about I the tripod. Them. That's not the kind of writer I am, so I'm not... She made a furious... Do you know what it is? With her right hand. I'm not a great writer, but well, Because you saw it last time, remember? I don't think I've ever identified so completely. No, it's, it was the one that was in the plastic bag, remember? Debate over what that one. As literature. I, too, am a storyteller. I, too, eschew the furious sibling motion kind of writing. I care about language and structure and pace, but I care about plot and characters more. I know I'm not the kind of writer who wins prizes and a place on the ninth grade summer reading list, the kind of writer who gets called great. And, lucky me, if I was ever in danger of forgetting precisely where on the literary food chain I reside, there are people lined up on the internet to remind me. But great writer was never my ambition, and I suspect was never within the own possibility. I knew that through education and inclination, through temperament and history, all, all authors grow up to be a particular kind of story. To know how change the kind of work we do, the voice in which we write, the characters that call to us, then we could our own blood type. I am the proud, happy writer of popular fiction, and I would never argue that it matters as much as the award-winning, breathtaking, life-changing meditations on love and humanity and the way we live now. I would also note that critics still stumble over the gender divide, where a man's dissection of a marriage or a family is seen as important and literary, whereas a woman's book about the same topic is dismissed as precious and jewel-like, domestic and small. Double standards persist, and in general, men's books are still perceived as more meaningful, more important, more desirable. Last summer, a writer for feminist website Jezebel revealed that querying six literary agents under a male name netted her five responses including three requests to see the manuscript within 24 hours, while the exact same letter sent 50 times under her own name had gotten a total of just two invitations to send her manuscript. The judgments about my work that had seemed as solid as the walls of my house had turned out to be meaningless, she wrote. My novel was a problem. It was me, Patrick. Clearly, there's progress to be made in how we regard women's work, and being the one who points out the problems does not earn you the miscongeniality sash. 
particularly when your insistence on fair play and a level playing field is interpreted as a form of delusion about the kind of books you write and the kind of attention you deserve. She thinks she's as good as Jonathan Franzen, my critics sneer. She thinks her stuff belongs in the New Yorker. Not true. As a lifelong reader of both literary and popular fiction, I am completely equipped to tell the difference, and I know what belongs where. What I believe is that popular fiction by and for women deserves the same regard as popular fiction by and for men. I believe that if the New York Times is going to review mysteries and thrillers and science fiction, it should also review romance, which remains by far the best-selling genre of all literature, and everything that comes under the catch-all umbrella of commercial women's fiction. Maybe it's like mine won't win the National Book Award, but that doesn't mean they don't matter at all. Nor does it mean that women who read them deserve to be ignored or erased. Women's stories matter. The stories we write, the stories we read. The big deal... ...winners of literary prizes and Harlequin stories matter. Tell us who we are, give us places to explore our problems, try on identities and imagine happy endings. They entertain us, they divert us, they comfort us when we're lonely or alone. Women's story or two. And the thing that on right in H&A, Frodom in the newspaper, Fear not, we'll get there. But I feel the of becoming a published author and a contributing writer for the New York Times. And the love and friends who make a few books do. I take a stand, take in heat, and I hope seeing the world change a little bit, but spoke up. I had a father who left me. I will murder these. I'm there to end. You get hurt. You get up again. These are stories of the hunger that we are taught to ignore or endure. They're about why. I'm a and subscribe. Drugs and appetites should never.